Claude McKay, born in 1889 in Clarendon Parish, Jamaica, was raised with a strong belief in his African ancestry, leading to his themes of writing about black life in his poetry. McKay became an avid lover of classical and British literature under his older brother's tutelage, initiating him to write poetry. His first poem, Songs of Jamaica, was written in traditional Jamaican dialect about black life in his country. Eventually, he moved to the United States to attend Kansas State University in 1912, before dropping out to pursue poetry in New York City. When he became part of the working class there, he saw firsthand the racism and the cruelty that was brought to his race. McKay became pronounced in his writing when he began to send his work to publishing magazines in the 1920s. The Harlem Dancer was one of his first successful magazine publications in 1917. For analysis purposes, it is important to just listen to the poem read out loud. Applauding youths laughed with young prostitutes and watched her perfect hath-clothed body sway. Her voice was like the sound of blended flutes brought by black players upon a picnic day. She sang and danced on gracefully and calm, the light gauze hanging loose about her form. To me she seemed a proudly swaying palm grown lovelier for passing through a storm. Upon her swarthy neck black shiny curls luxuriant fell, and tossing coins in praise. The wine flushed bold-eyed boys and even the girls devoured her shape with eager, passionate gaze. But looking at her falsely smiling face, I knew herself was not in that strange place. The poem has four breaks that line up the speaker's observations and thoughts. In his first implied stanza, McKay writes about the speaker's observations, starting with the audience in the club. As they watch the performance of the Harlem Dancer, these observations seem to be taken as if outside of the group. It is clear that the speaker doesn't want to be identified with those who are applauding and laughing with the young prostitutes. It is here that we get our first description of the dancer, as she is half-clothed and perfect. She contrasts with the typical atmosphere of the club as she sways to the music, her voice light and airy like blended flutes. The speaker defines her as graceful and calm. These are very light-hearted descriptions, and as readers, we begin to visualize this woman singing something upbeat and happy in an environment that isn't. The speaker identifies his first oddity when he describes her dressings. Choosing the word gauze is significant symbolism that could be picked up from many different angles. Gauze, being a type of bandage, has the purpose of protecting a wound from infections and keeping bodily fluid in. To describe her gauze as light and hanging loose around her, this protection isn't good anymore. It may have once been able to protect her from the environment she works in, but no longer serves its purpose. She sways proudly, though, like a palm after a storm. The speaker doesn't see this storm or tragedy in the dancer's life as ugly, but instead enhances the woman as a whole, as she has grown lovelier for passing through. As the sonnet comes to an end, as readers, we see that the speaker has become mesmerized by her beauty, by his comments of her swarthy or dark neck and her black, shiny curls that fall luxuriantly. And as the speaker's effort to not become like the audience almost crumbles as we watch them being drawn into her performance, the tossing of coins is what seems to break the speaker's trance back to the audience. There is a shift words used now. Laughed and young are replaced with wine-flushed, bold-eyed, and eager, passionate. As the audience devours the dancer, McKay brings the readers to the apex of the sonnet, concluding that the dancer is really not in the club, However, someplace else in her mind, we hope much nicer. The last two lines of the sonnet usually follow the previous 12 lines by revealing something to the readers. McKay successfully changed the tone of the poem by revealing the dancer's mental state and her willingness to survive at any cost. The Negro Dancer, another Shakespearean sonnet by McKay, is very similar to the content of the Harlem Dancer, especially in its focus on a young audience and young dancers. Harlem nightclubs were important places for black people to gather against the threats that plagued them. The Negro Dancer describes more of a pleasant party scene in the audience's point of view, using phrases like happy and merry, while Harlem Dancer focuses on the woman dancing. Both poems do speak of a darker undertone to the Harlem nightlife. Negro Dancer's last line, dancing, the world of shadows to forget, describes the need to forget what hardships the audience has faced prior to their time in the nightclub. Similar to the dancer's need to forget her difficulties that force her to sing and dance and-